Jamison, the uh, organiser of the July Lectures in Physics program, and it's my enormous pleasure to welcome you back here for our second July lecture in our program for 2015 on the theme of the International Year of Light. And uh, the subtitle is Near and Distant Light. And tonight we're going to be on the Near Light. Uh, there's another anniversary that I'm going to just mention before we invite uh, Professor Crozier to the stage. It's the 150th uh, anniversary of Maxwell's equations. Uh, that's how I more or less ended up my lecture last week. And if you uh, want to see it again or you missed it, there's, uh, we're very modern here in the science faculty. We've got a YouTube site. And that, um, you can see it up there. I don't know whether you write that string of characters down, but you can certainly find it on the science faculty website. Um, and that is the correct address, u.youtube.be. That is correct. The dot isn't in the wrong place. But Maxwell uh, said um, 150 years ago in the conclusion of his paper, uh, the agreement of the results, the uh, equations in his paper, uh, seems to show that light and magnetism are affect affections of the same substance and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated uh, through the field according to the electromagnetic laws. And this was one of the most revolutionary findings in physics and we are still today, uh, 150 years later, exploring uh, the consequences of Maxwell's great discovery. And tonight's lecture is going to be on that topic. So tonight's lecture is by Professor Ken Crozier, who occupies a joint position of physics and electrical engineering in the university. Uh, Ken comes to us after a uh, PhD at Stanford University in uh, California in 2003, after an undergraduate uh, program here at the University of Melbourne. After his uh, PhD studies, he had postdoctoral fellowships in Stanford, and then he moved to Harvard University, uh, where he spent uh, 10 years uh, on the staff there before returning to Australia, and we're very pleased that he cho chose to do that, uh, only in July last year. So even uh, just one year on, uh, we've persuaded him uh, to give us a July lecture on his uh, field of near light. Now, before we begin uh, this lecture, in addition, uh, Maxwell, of course, uh, passed away, uh, and in addition to his words, what he would have said if he was here tonight, he would have said, please turn off your electromagnetic devices uh, for the duration of the lecture. And in addition, um, following the uh, strong tradition of physics demos, we do have a particularly uh, vigorous electromagnetic demo today, um, tonight, which will generate a lot of electromagnetic pulses. If you have internal electrical apparatus such as a pacemaker or uh, other um, devices, uh, you may want to consider moving back uh, because it, um, this device uh, it, at least it makes my nerves twitch, let alone my pacemaker if I had one, which I don't. So ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome Professor Ken Crozier to the stage. So thank you very much, David, for the kind introduction and indeed for inviting me to speak at this July lecture. So my name is Ken Crozier. I'm a professor of physics and electronic engineering. And the title of my talk tonight is Nanoscale Light, the surprising world of optical nanostructures. And over the next hour, I'd like to take us on a journey to the world of optical nanostructures. And what I hope to convince you is that not only is there some very fascinating physics in terms of how light can interact with nanostructures, focusing it to tiny spots that are far smaller than the wavelength. And even by engineering that interaction between light and the material, we can do things such as change its color. So not, not only will we see fascinating physics, but we'll see that there's some exciting potential applications ranging from medicine, where people are experimenting with using metal nanoparticles to treat cancer tumors, as well as the detection of chemicals at very low concentrations. And folks are using <coughs> metal nanoparticles to uh, detect the presence of minute quantities of contamination on fruits, for example. And to begin our uh, journey, let's begin with a few preliminaries. So, as uh, David mentioned in last week, light has both particle and wave natures. 
And its wave nature can be understood by treating it as electromagnetic waves with time varying electric and magnetic fields. And one uh, particular example of an electromagnetic field that we, uh, we frequently consider is that of a plane wave. So a wave that's uh, traveling along uh, this direction here that has electric and magnetic fields that are orthogonal to the direction of propagation. In other words, they have constant values over planes. And so let's start with our first demonstration. Okay, and so it's not going to be the um, the the the, uh, the um, Hertz's apparatus, which is shown in the front here, but rather a uh, demonstration here. Well, I'm just going to switch over to the um, cameras so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Okay, great. So what we have is we have a transmitting uh, antenna that's shown here. Okay, so that's a electric dipole antenna has uh, two halves to it, and it's attached to a um, a, uh, a voltage source uh, that's going to produce an, a uh, voltage at one gigahertz. And then, so that's going to produce an electromagnetic wave. And actually, what I'll do is I'll switch back to the. Um, let's see now. See if I can. Yeah, so that's going to produce an electromagnetic wave. Uh, in other words, it's going to have electric and magnetic fields. And the electric fields are going to be polarized along the horizontal direction, along, along this direction, the plane of, the, of this table here. Uh, th those are the electric fields. Whereas the magnetic fields are going to be in the vertical direction. And so, as I said, this is the transmitting antenna. Over here, I have a coil. Okay, so I have this uh, coil. And so it's going to be picking up the magnetic fields. Uh, and so one can see that in this diagram here, we have a diagram of a coil. There's a magnetic field that's going through it. And so if indeed the magnetic field is uh, oriented in that direction with respect to the coil, we'll be able to pick up a signal. Okay, so let me see now. Where's the switch? Okay, here it is. So we've got the, uh, we've got the, um, the voltage going to the antenna. And then over on the other side, on the receiving antenna, which is a coil right now, we have the wires that are connected to this uh, meter here that where if you look at the meter there, then that's going to read the magnitude of the signal that it's picking up. So right now, let's see what happens. If I move it a bit closer, the signal's increasing. You can see that needle moving. Let's see what happens when I turn that coil so it's in this direction here. So the signal's dropping right down to close to zero. And so what's happening there is that when the coil is oriented in this horizontal direction, then we have the magnetic fields uh, going through it as such here, and we pick up a signal. Okay, so now I'm going to switch over to another type of antenna. Uh, and so I'm going to put in these, remove the coil and put in these two, uh, two metal pieces to convert this from a uh, magnetic dipole type of antenna to an electric dipole antenna that will pick up the electric field. So removing this coil is probably one of the trickier parts of the lecture. <laughs> I was worried about breaking it, so I ensured that we start off with the coil. Okay, I didn't break it, so we can use it again. Okay. Okay, great. So, let's switch that back on again. And so now, we have, again, we have a high signal. Large signal, move it a bit closer to the transmitting antenna. Increases a bit, then let's rotate it. Sure enough, the signal drops. Okay, great. So, electromagnetic waves. We'll start by looking at electromagnetic waves. Okay, and so actually, here's an uh, illustration of how that uh, dipole antenna, uh, the electric dipole antenna, is uh, working. So, you can see that when the electric fields of the incident wave coming from that transmitting antenna, or in this plane here, then we can drive this current backwards and forth through the uh, receiving antenna and we get a voltage across our uh, resistor there. Okay, great. So, I've talked about electromagnetic fields. We've seen this uh, radio wave um, and we've picked it up with the uh, receiving antenna, either a magnetic dipole or electric dipole. We may think, you know, what's this got to do with light? This is meant to be all about light. Okay, so, uh, so Radio waves, uh, light, and so forth, they're all part of the electromagnetic spectrum and they differ in wavelength. Short wavelengths, we have cosmic rays. 
In the middle we have uh, visible light, and then along wavelengths we have radio waves, such as you use to, in radio reception. And so our lecture tonight will be talking about this part of the spectrum, the so-called optical portion of the spectrum. Uh, the visible light running from about 400 nanometer wavelength to about 700 nanometer wavelength, in addition ultraviolet as well as infrared. <laughs> So, we have another demonstration over here. So, that topic of uh, visible light. Um, so, we have a uh, projector here. So, it has a lamp in it that's emitting a quite a wide spectrum of uh, light. And we're going to send it through this object over on the other side. And um, what are we going to see? So, we, what we see is this uh, we split apart the spectrum. We can see the visible portion of the spectrum running from short wavelengths here, the blue. Uh, all the way to the long wavelengths, uh, the longer wavelengths in the red. So in other words, what we, have, what we have here is a diffraction grating. Well, this one's operating in transmission. That has a lot of fine lines on it. When the light impinges upon that, it scatters from the lines, and light of a particular wavelength, there'll be constructive interference between those scattered waves along a particular direction. And as one varies the wavelength, then the light comes out in different directions. And that's what we saw uh, over here. Okay, so tonight we're talking about uh, optics and we're talking about nanostructures. So what do we mean by optical nanostructures? What we mean is we have structures whose interaction with light is strongly modified by the fact that one or more dimensions are smaller than the wavelength. So that's going to be our, uh, our journey tonight into the world of optical nanostructures. And the starting point of our journey will be, what do you think it's going to be? Some advanced nanofabrication facility? No, the British Museum. Okay, why are we starting in the British Museum? Well, let's think, and we, when we're talking about optical nanostructures, uh, for, for the next little bit, we're going to be talking about uh, particles of gold and silver. So normally one thinks about gold and silver, one thinks about, for example, gold bars in uh, Fort Knox, or perhaps the silver uh, medals from the Sydney Olympics. And so these are the familiar optical properties of gold and silver. Uh, gold appears golden, a yellowish colour, and silver appears, well, silverish. So you think on the nanoscale that's going to be much the same, but in fact that's not the case. And so here I show a picture of a cup that's in the British Museum. So that's the connection to the British Museum. And this cup is called the Lycurgus cup. And so it's made out of glass, but it has something in it that changes its colour. In fact, it has gold and silver particles. So you may think, well, if the particles are very small, you think, well, they still should appear golden or silverish, but maybe just very kind of faint. But that's not the case. And it has this very interesting property that when one places a light inside it, for example, sticks a um, flashlight inside that bulb and then observes it, the cup appears red. However, if we're viewing it in reflected light, it appears green. So what's going on there? Well, scientists took the cup and they examined the glass. Hopefully they didn't need to uh, take too much of it. Anyway, they examined the glass in an electron microscope and this is what they saw. So gold uh, and silver nanoparticles. This one here is about 70 nanometers across. Okay, so just as a point of reference, the hu a human hair may be about 70 micron across or about uh, 70,000 nanometers. Of course that depends on the particular person, but of that <laughs> approximately that uh, value. So what's going on here? Well, we can understand that by thinking about one of these particles. So as you can see, that previous particle was not a sphere, but just for simplicity, one can consider a sphere. So let's say we've got a little sphere of gold. So it's got electrons in it that are free to the mo move out of the influence <laughs> of a field, and so that's why uh, they're good conductors. And let's say we were to displace those electrons to the right, okay, just somehow. We have the negative charge of the electrons, so the, the right hand side is going to be negatively charged, and then the left hand side will be positively charged because we moved the electrons away. And there's going to be a restoring force to re establish charge neutrality. The negative is going to be attracted to the positive. So this situation is somewhat akin to a mass on a spring, where when we stretch it out, there's a restoring force that tends to pull the mass back and we have the mass being the mass of the electrons. So what happens when we release, we pull the mass on the spring and we release it? It'll oscillate. Right? And that oscillation frequency will be due to the 
the mass that's there, and then the spring constant of the spring. How stiff it is. Is it very stiff or is it very floppy? So what happens when we release these electrons? They'll also oscillate. And for metals such as gold and silver, if we go through the, the maths and look at what the spring constant is and what the mass is, uh, sure enough what we'll find is that that oscillation frequency is in the visible. So if we come in from the top with visible light uh, and we're polarised along this direction here, the electric field's along that direction, so we can exert the force in the electrons and pull them to begin with, then we can resonantly excite that oscillation. And so that oscillation frequency is about 580 terahertz. In other words, it corresponds to light of a wavelength of about 520 nanometers. In other words, green light. So if we strike it with green light, those electrons will really oscillate. What happens when they oscillate? Well, if we look at the, if we take a snapshot of that sphere at some instant in time, remember we said we pull the electrons over to the right, negative charge of the electron, positive charge of uh, the atoms that have been left behind. We have electric fields that start on the positive charges and terminate on the negative charges, okay? So that's kind of like in a snapshot in time. Of course, this is all oscillating, right? Because you've got the in input light, 580 terahertz, so it's all oscillating. And so as the, and so, um, you know, this is what it's shown at one particular instant in time. Half a cycle later, we point in the other direction. And as it oscillates back and forth, these field lines can start to separate from the sphere and propagate away. And so I've got a little movie of that. There's electric fields, as we oscillate back and forth, then those electric field lines are separating away, and they propagate away by actions of Maxwell's equations. The electric fields generate the magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields generate the electric fields. Okay, so we come to the demonstration. Okay, so this is the, um, the one that uh, David was mentioning. Okay, actually what I should do is make it even more dramatic. I'm going to turn off the light here. Okay. So I have this uh, DC voltage generator that's connected to this induction coil here. And then there's some wires that run to this uh, structure. What's going to happen is I'm going to switch it on and it's going to supply a uh, large voltage to that structure. Okay. Great. So now I really feel like a mad scientist. So what's happening is the voltage is large enough so that there are sparks going back and forth between these two uh, uh, spheres that are separated about by about uh, one centimetre and then that's exciting radio waves from this structure here. So let's see what happens when I put this fluorescent tube here. Wow, look at that. Okay, everyone can relax, including me. Okay, so all that's happening there is that, let me just turn on the lights. So what's happening is the, uh, so we've got this uh, structure here, it's acting as an antenna. Okay, so we've got those two uh, kind of uh, squares there They're acting as an antenna. And as the sparks leap from one side of the structure to the other, it excites the antenna to resonate. And due to the inductance and capacitance of that structure, that resonance frequency is about 55 megahertz or so. And so it's producing these electromagnetic waves, and then that fluorescent tube is acting as an antenna. So remember when I had it horizontal, it picked up, it could pick up the uh, waves because those waves are horizontally polarized. It could pick it up, and then you saw the, the light coming out. Whereas when it was vertical, then it, the polarization wasn't correct to be picking it up. And so here's a picture of Hertz. Uh, and this is the apparatus that he used. Okay, so pretty similar here. It's a totally different shape and so forth. But as he's receiving antenna, rather than using a fluorescent tube, he actually used another coil of wire with those two little balls there. And so when he had it close enough, then he could actually observe uh, sparks across the gap when the orientation was correct. Okay, so, so that's that, uh, that structure is generating electromagnetic waves. It's exactly the same concept that we saw for the case of, this, uh, of the sphere, right? But this is happening at a much higher frequency. This, so this is about 580 terahertz, whereas that was at about uh, 55 megahertz or so. But all exactly the same structure. And exactly the same, I should, sorry, uh, I should say physics. 
Okay, great. So coming back to that Lycurgus cup. Okay, so what happens is we have our gold uh, nanoparticles. There's also some silver ones. We shine light from this light bulb. We have this broad spectrum that we saw earlier on with the slide projector, you know, blue to green to red and beyond, shines into the gold nanoparticle. And so the green light can excite that nanoparticle. To, the electrons really oscillate in that particle. We radiate out fields, and then we can see the, the green color. What happens to the blue and the red? Well, the red can go straight through, a little bit of scattering as well, but nowhere near as pronounced as the green light. And the blue can, uh, is, can be scattered a bit, but uh, mainly it's absorbed. So the cup appears green, whereas when we have transmitted light, the green light is scattered out. Also, plenty of it is absorbed. We'll see an application of that a little bit later on. And the blue light also gets scattered a bit, but also gets the tons of absorption there. So it appears red. So quite an amazing uh, uh, structure, an example of the nanotechnology, I guess, from, uh, from the ancient times. And that brings me to another demonstration, okay? So let's see now. Uh, I'm going to switch this on here. Okay. It's all right. Don't worry. It's not dangerous. Just made a little bit of noise there. Okay. And then I should put some gloves on here. So another example of uh, optical nanostructures, but a rather different sort. Uh, the different sort and it's an example of something you may have seen tonight on your way to this lecture theatre. Um, I should have told Steve the size of my hands before he brought the gloves along. But anyway, everything's good. Okay, great. So what I have in here is hydrochloric acid. But don't worry, it's very dilute. Steve tells me anyway. Notice I'm doing it, not him. Okay, I'm just going to put a little bit of this in there. And so what we have inside the uh, tank is uh, sodium thiosulfate. Give it a nice stir. <laughs> Sorry. Turn, turn the lights down a bit. Yes, yes. Okay, so. Okay, so watch the color, okay? So I guess there's two colors we're talking about. We're talking about the color of the transmitted light, as well as the color kind of coming at you that you can see when you look directly at the tank, okay? So just observing that. You notice it's starting to have a bit of a kind of a cloudy color. You see kind of a slightly cloudy kind of bluish uh, coloring there. Okay, the, um, the transmitted light looks uh, still pretty yellowish, but still, it does seem to be getting more and more cloudy uh, as uh, time progresses. What we start to see is, yes, you can still see the yellowish color there. And so this is what's happening here is we're having, um, we've got the sodium thiosulfur that was already in the, in, the, in, the, in the water there. Then we added a bit of hydrochloric acid. What we're having is we're having a reaction. So we're forming, um, uh, solid sodium, uh, not sodium, sulfur particles, I should say, forming sulfur particles. And that bluish color that you start to see, what's happening there is that the, the light is being scattered by those particles. So light is being scattered by those particles, and it's a type of scattering called uh, Rayleigh scattering, and it's stronger for shorter wavelengths. So it in other words, it has a one on lambda to four type of dependence, so it's stronger for shorter wavelengths, so therefore, uh, the light you see is, tends to have that bluish tint to it. But I think you maybe start to notice here, the colour coming through, it's kind of a nice uh, bright yellow before, but now it's starting to darken up a little bit. 
And so what's going to happen is as, as that process continues, it's going to be um, kind of similar to the Lycurgus cup in that we've got some light scattered out of the beam and we've got some transmitted light. Now in the case of the Lycurgus cup, that was a little bit different because those particles, those gold particles, they had that resonance due to the interplay between the mass of the electrons and then that restoring force, they gave them a resonant frequency. So they scattered green very strongly. Whereas these particles, as it happens, they don't have that particular resonance. So they just tend to, the, the short little wavelength, they just scatter more and more strongly. So hence these, the, the, when you look at the tank, it doesn't appear green or anything like that. It just kind of appears bluish. Okay, we're really starting to notice it now. As you can see, it's getting to be quite a kind of a deep uh, yellow there. And as the process continues, it will just uh, keep on uh, getting kind of darker and darker. And so what do you think? I mean, when I uh, started this, I said it was maybe it's something similar to what you saw on the way to this lecture theory. And I'm assuming you didn't see someone putting hydrochloric acid into sod uh, sodium thiosulfate, right? So anyone has a guess of what I uh, was referring to there? The sunset, exactly. Exactly that same sort of uh, process there. So we'll, let, we'll just let that uh, continue for a little bit. And I'll just keep on uh, lecturing. And uh, so what's happening there is we've got the um, hydrochloric acid, the sodium thiosulfate, and then we're getting uh, a little bit of sulfur dioxide, sodium chloride, and then sulfur is what you're seeing. So in other words, we've got light hitting the particles, the short wavelengths are scattered more, so you see those, and then the longer wavelengths are red. I can still I can see it's actually quite a nice uh, orange there, are getting scattered more. Okay, we'll just let that continue for a little bit. And so, you know, those are the techniques, you know, the Lycurgus like cup, it's not actually known exactly uh, what techniques the, the Romans used to produce those particles. I mean, people know how to produce those particles, but it wasn't known uh, what they used in particular. Uh, and so, you know, folks have been able to make uh, these sort of structures for a while, not necessarily understanding everything. But in recent years, there's been tremendous developments in nanostructured optical materials. And it's been due to several uh, factors that I've listed here. The first that I, would, that I think is perhaps the most important is a tremendous explosion in top-down nanofabrication techniques. So what I mean by that is techniques by which we can pattern materials on the nanoscale. And much of this is done in clean rooms and it's really originating from techniques that have been developed by the integrated circuit industry to make electrical devices, transistors, computer chips, that we need ever small, smaller features in order for the transistors to run faster and for there to be more memory and for our uh, smartphones, computers to have ever better uh, performance. And so those techniques can be also used to make optical structures. And so this is uh, some pictures of my student doing electron beam lithography and plasma etching to make some silicon nanowires that we'll, we'll talk about later. Another important trend is bottom-up nanofabrication. So chemistry and material science folks developing techniques, uh, either, uh, for example, growing nanowires in furnaces or doing chemistry to make uh, metallic nanoparticles. It's amazing what they can make now and what sorts of control they get. Another very important one has been the rapid growth in computing power. Right? And so what that means is we can run Maxwell's equations on a desktop computer and predict how these structures uh, behave. And so literally we can draw a picture of a structure, define its uh, refractive index and then send a wave onto it and look at what happens. Okay? And so this is a uh, picture from some of the software that we use in my own group. It's something I found on the web. So this is a app that one can download. It's a little bit hard to see, but that looks like a floor plan of a room. So there's an app you can download. Apparently, I've never tried it out. But you can draw a floor plan of your room, put in the location of your Wi-Fi antenna, and it'll use Maxwell's equations on your smartphone to predict what your wireless reception is going to be by actually calculating Maxwell's equations around the room. So that's going to be done on the smartphone. It's amazing. And so this is means we can predict the properties of nanostructures, make them, and then also go ahead and do the measurements. And, and in that, the rapid advances in digital cameras and lasers are really key there. Okay, so by now I think you can see the, uh, the beautiful red color that we're getting uh, through that. So I'm going to switch the lights back on. Okay, so, so many, uh, many exciting capabilities and exciting applications and physics that goes along with it. The first I'll talk about is that of cancer therapy. And so what are we on about there? Well, remember, we had this previous picture of a metal particle and what we said was that, you know, we, we set up this oscillation 
And then what happens after a while, that oscillation dies down, right? So what happened there? Well, as it oscillated, it generated these fields that radiated and they were carrying away energy. So some of the energy went to that. Okay, but also there's, it was dissipated in the nanosphere. So it's turned into heat inside the nanosphere. And so uh, some folks decided to use that for cancer therapy. And they use a structure that's called a nano shell. So it's a, it's a, so previously we talked about this gold nanosphere. It's a solar piece of gold. But then, they talk, but then what they've done is they've moved to this other structure called a nano shell. We have a glass core surrounded by a thin layer of gold. In this case, the oscillation frequency was determined by that interplay between the, that spring constant due to the restoring force within the massive electrons. In the case of the gold nano shell, as it happens, it turns out that thickness of that gold as compared to the radius of the glass core determines the oscillation frequency. And what that allows them to do is rather than just being stuck at that 520 nanometers, the green light, they can tune this out into the near infrared. So here are some calculations where the vertical axis, it's called something called extinction cross section. So it's basically when, you, when it's as a maximum value, then it's oscillating very strongly, okay? Uh, and so what they've done is, is they've kept the core, the, um, yeah, the core has the fixed uh, radius of 60 nanometers and they vary the shell thickness from 20 nanometers down to five nanometers. You can see that that peak shifts from the visible right into the near infrared. So why is near infrared useful for these medical applications? Well, the so-called near infrared window is, is the reason. So this is a plot of the effective penetration depth of light of various wavelengths into breast tissue. What you can see that we have a strong, a high penetration depth. So the light can go far when we're in this range of wavelengths between about 650 to 1350 nanometers. Okay? And so what that means is one can shine a laser through the skin and it can get further uh, we can get a reasonable distance into the, into the tissue. And so this is what they did. This is an early experiment. Okay, so this fellow here, he's got a piece of chicken breast. And he's injecting some of these nano shells into it. You can see that black kind of dot. And then he shines the infrared laser, so it's just barely visible. What's happening there? It's kind of burning away. So you can see that little black uh, area. And when, we leave, when he leaves the laser on this other area, it hardly has any effect at all. So what's happening is the, he's tuned the uh, nanoshells to be in the resonance with the laser. And so when he puts those nanoshells into the chicken breast and shines the laser onto them, they're able to go through the chicken breast, right? Because they've got the penetration depth. And they go to where the nanoshells are. The nanoshells get hot. Then it burns the, uh, the tissue away, okay? And whereas if you have the laser in other parts of the tissue, they don't have the nanoshells, they don't get burned away. So what's the idea behind this? This is what they're working on in this uh, Rice University in Texas. The idea is this. Take a patient, inject some gold into them, gold nanoshells. They'll go through the body and will end up in the tumours. They'll tend to accumulate in these tumours where they've got these tons of little leaky blood vessels that accumulate there, zap it with the infrared laser. They can go through the skin to the place where the tumour is. It'll heat up those nanoshells, but only a bit. You won't, you'll just get it to be heated up enough. So it kills off those cancer cells. Then the dead cells will dissipate. The tumor will shrink and the gold nanoshells will leave the body. So that's the idea. Uh, of course, there's some way off for really proving that in humans, but they've been doing uh, tests with uh, mice. And so they've been using nanoshells, but also another structure that they call a like nanomatrushka, they're very creative about um, names in nanotechnology. It's inspired by the matrushkas. You one doll inside the other, right? So you have a gold core, a silica glass uh, coating, and then another gold coating. Here's the electron microscope image. And so what they do is they, they have start with some uh, mice that have highly aggressive uh, breast cancers. And then what they do is they inject it into the tail of the mice. Just inject a little bit. And then it circulates around, and then it accumulates in the tumour. It just has to be the right size. So if it's less than 100 nanometers, apparently, I'm not a medical person, but apparently that's just right, and so it accumulates in the tumours. And then what they do is they shine the infrared laser onto it for five uh, minutes, and then they run this course uh, over uh, two months or so, and then they uh, always take images of the uh, mice uh, as, the, as it's progressing, and these bioluminescence images, they're able to... Uh, 
pinpoint um, how large a cancer is. And so here's some typical examples when they injected the nano shells and did the laser treatment, then you could see after 13 days, this tumor shrunk quite a bit. Here's the case of the nano matrushka. It uh, shrinks, and so it's uh, kind of easy to see there. And so what they found was 83% of those treated with the nano matrushkas appeared healthy and tumor free after the course of the experiment, 60 days. A third of the mice are treated with the nano shells appeared healthy and tumor free after the two months. And none of the mice in the control group where they just injected saline solution, the illuminated with laser survived the course. So it's very exciting results. And these nanomatriscas, the difference here is that when you shine light onto them, they're a little bit more efficient or they're quite a bit more efficient at converting that light into heat, which is what you want to uh, affect that tumor. And they're also, as it happened, these are a little bit smaller. And so they, uh, they suppose that they're better at getting into the, uh, the tumor there. So that's one example of potential application of optical nanostructure. Let's move to the next, chemical detection, okay? So let's say I've got a molecule. Yeah. Is that just one five-minute treatment or five minutes per day over the 60 days? I believe it was just, a, I believe it was one five-minute treatment. I can double check for you at the end, but I believe it was just a one, yes, I believe so. I believe it was just a one five-minute treatment, but I'll double check that for you. Okay, so the so let's see now the um, molecule. Let's say we've got a molecule. Okay, we illuminate it with light, say green light. Most of the time, the light's just elastically scattered. In other words, the outgoing photon is also green. But now and then, the incoming photon can excite the molecule to vibrate one of its vibrational modes, where the atoms in the molecule are moving in a certain pattern, and the bonds between them are, are stretching and contracting or twisting. Now, there's energy associated with that. So what that means is the outgoing photon has actually less energy, incoming photon, it's a little bit redder. Or in the other case, you could have the situation where the molecule is already vibrating, and then you pick up a bit of energy from it. In other words, you leave it in a state where it's not vibrating anymore. And then what happens then is you have, that's called anti-stokes Raman scattering, so the light's a bit bluer, it's not, it's not green anymore. So if you collect this light and send it into a spectrometer, what's a spectrometer? Well, it's basically what we saw earlier on, just a gradient. Okay, you just send the light through the gradient, the different wavelengths get spread out, and then rather than just having a screen there, you put a, a sensitive camera there. That allows you to measure something called a spectrum. You see a series of lines, and they correspond to the modes of the molecule. And so what that means is if you measure the spectrum, you can identify what the molecule is, because a certain molecule will have a certain set of vibrational modes. And so what that means is the Raman's scattering spectrum is a fingerprint of the molecule, so what that means is it could be, this technique could be excellent for chemical detection. And so it is used for chemical detection, but what happens when you want to get down to very small numbers of uh, molecules or very dilute concentrations? So let's say we just get one molecule, okay? And we shine a laser onto it with a power that's similar to the power from a laser pointer, about a milliwatt or so, okay? So if that's the case, and we just take the cross section, the Raman scattering cross section that one has for most molecules, then there'll only be one Raman scattered photon every six days, or every few days, okay? Uh, and so what that means is Raman scattering is a very weak effect, and so it's, uh, it's hard to use it for sensing chemicals at low concentrations. So how can the optical nanostructures help? Well, remember back at our picture of these, those charge distribution around the nanostructure, along with that we have the electric fields that start in the positive charges, terminate on negative charges. So these charges are really concentrated around the end of the nanostructure, and so if we use Maxwell's equations, the same Maxwell's equations that David mentioned at the beginning, and calculate the fields around the structure, and so that colour there, blue represents low intensity, reddish colour represents high intensity, you can just think about the, as the intensity of light, and so you can see the light is really concentrated in this tiny region here. That skull, that's from here to here is only 200 nanometers, right? It's a very small and deep, so it can be concentrated in a tiny region. So if we have the molecules sitting there, then we can actually boost up how much Raman scattering we're going to get from them, and also it boosts up the, the, um, the collection process as well, the emission process as well. If we take two particles and separate them by a, even small, by a very small gap, for example, just a few nanometers, we can have this tremendous concentration of light there. And if we put a molecule or molecules in there, then we can get down to that limit and even detect single molecules. And so here are some examples of applications. Some folks developed these nanoparticles where it's a type of nanoshell, but right, right now you have a, in this case you have a gold core separated uh, or um, surrounded by this glass shell. 
And they refer to this as smart dust. So they just spread it over any sort of object, any type of substrate, and they can then do Raman spectrum. So shine a laser onto it, collect the light, put it into a spectrometer, and then look at the different lines that one gets. And here, the, they did, how, did a whole bunch of different things in this paper. Uh, and here they spread it onto the surface of this orange, okay, and then they can measure the spectra. So actually here we have a few spectra. These spectra are measured from a, just a orange as such. And then this blue one is <coughs> measured from an orange that has a bit of this uh, contamination on it that is actually a pesticide. But in the regular Raman spectra that doesn't have these particles, you just shine the laser on and collect the signal, you hardly measure. Uh, you, these look very similar. But when they put the gold nanoparticles onto that, then you get this tremendous concentration of fields just around this region where those contaminating molecules are. And so they can actually pick up these lines here that indicate that it has this uh, contamination, which is uh, some uh, pesticide residue. And for comparison, they did uh, spectroscopy just of a solid sample of that contaminant. And you can see that those are, the, those are indeed the correct lines that indicate that they've got some of that on there. Here's another example that developed something called a microfluidic chip. So one of the advances in recent years in the era of uh, microtechnology has been in this area called the microfluidic chip, or sometimes it's called laminate chip. So the idea is that they take all the function that's normally performed in a chemical lab, you know, mixing together chemicals and so forth, and perform it all in a chip that's just, you know, this size here, very small size. This one here, as it happens, is uh, 16 by 25 millimeters. So these chips have little channels in them and they have little pumps and valves and so forth that allow them to mix chemicals together. And so the idea being that you would be able to have very small quantities of chemicals and so it would be uh, much cheaper. Uh, we could have massive throughput because all these operations can operate in parallel. And also um, many of these samples, if they're from individuals, then it means you have to take a smaller quantity of samples. So that's obviously very much welcomed. And so here they've developed this chip where they have a few different ports going into it. They have some oil going into it, and then they have a bacterial suspension where they've taken bacteria, um, busted them up with ultrasonic waves, and got the suspension that they input to the chip, and then some silver particles, and then also a bit of uh, uh, potassium chloride. And what they do is they have these special little nozzles that inject that bacterial suspension into the oil to produce droplets of bacterial suspension in oil. It goes through the channels, comes to another nozzle, that as the droplets pass by, it injects silver particles into it. Okay? And then so you have this mixture of silver particles and this bacterial suspension. And so these silver particles aggregate together, and then the tiny gaps between them, when they pass through this area here that's shown with this green dot, we have a laser, then the, uh, they shine onto these gold particles, you excite that Raman scan, you excite those. Uh, really intense field inside the gaps between the particles due to those oscillating charges in the gold, in these silver particles. And then with those, uh, in those, around those gaps we have the bacteria, all the different chemicals that are in the bacteria. And so they're able to take a measurement. And so here are all these different spectra or different strains of uh, E. coli. So they're able to identify these strains of E. coli just in this very simple chip that can be operated basically automatically. And they have a computer program to identify that. So very exciting. And here's some work from my lab. We made a chip that has these silver structures. We have these two silver particles that are separated by a gap just of a few nanometers. When you shine light onto it, there's a tremendous concentration of light inside that gap. And so we sprinkle these molecules over this chip. And when there's a molecule inside the gap, you can actually measure the spectrum just of a single molecule. OK, so another exciting application, this time not involving the metal particles. Uh, but rather involving silicon, and it's for the, uh, an application in digital cameras, so new types of light detectors for image sensors. And so some of you may have seen a silicon wafer before. So silicon wafer appears kind of a grayish, uh, silverish color, and so these are the wafers that are used in computer chips. And this is, it appears that color before, uh, at, when it's before the processing started, okay? But one thing we discovered a few years ago was that we could make nanowires from them. And so this square contains about 10,000 nanowires. This is a zoom in picture of the nanowires, about one micron long. And these uh, had radii of 45 nanometers. And they're standing up vertically from the substrate. We put it into the optical microscope. We saw that rather than just having this dull gray color of the silicon in the bulk form, it had this range of colors going from kind of a uh, pinkish, reddish color to purple, blue, 
green and even green color here. So these are just squares full of nanowires, about 10,000 nanowires per square. Here's another pattern that we made. And if you zoom in on letter A, you see these individual blue dots. These are individual silicon nanowires. So we can really change the color of them in a very pronounced way. So why is that the case? Why do these silicon nanowires display these vivid colors? Well, the answer is because they're acting as white pipes. We come in from the top of the light. We can actually couple the light inside into the, um, into the nanowire. So I'll give you a demonstration now. And see so here we have a uh, much larger light pipe. Okay, so this is a piece of uh, Perspex. Uh, and so, you know, it's um, much, much larger. Of those silicon ones had diameters of about 100 nanometers. There's a diameter of about a centimeter. Okay, so here have a laser. It's hitting the screen there. You can see a red dot on the screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to position this uh, laser right at the end of the light pipe. And so what's happening is light is being guided by that light pipe. And you can just see the light. You can see the end face of that... Um, uh, tube there just lighting up red. You can also see red from the turn where it loops around uh, a lot. Okay, so this structure is acting as a light pipe. So what's going on there? Well, the um, this Perspex has a refractive index that's uh, you know similar to glass. It's quite a bit larger than air. And so what that means is at the interface between the uh, Perspex and the air, we can have the process of total internal reflection. So light, when it goes inside this perspex, perspex has a higher refractive index than the air. So that means is when the light comes at a large enough angle, then we can undergo total internal reflection. You may have seen that before inside the swimming pool. Here, for example, we see this uh, turtle here, and we can kind of see the top of it uh, due to the fact that light has been reflected off this the, uh, water surface. You've got water, you've got air, water's got the higher refractive index in the air. You've got total internal reflection, you can see that. So, that allows these light pipes to guide light around bends. And so here, on this light pipe, the surface isn't terribly smooth. So there is a little bit of scattering. It's not, if it were really perfect, then you wouldn't see anything from this curved structure. But because of a little bit of scattering, you see that. So what's happening is, our nanostructures, our silicon nanowires, are actually acting as light pipes. Now, it's a rather interesting type of phenomenon that occurs. In this structure here, you know, the, the diameter there is about one centimetre. It's so much, much larger than the wavelength. Now, for our light pipes, their diameter is much smaller than the wavelength. And that gives them the interesting property that only certain wavelengths of light, certain colours of light, will be coupled to the nanowire. Only certain colours will come into the nanowire. And then, as they travel along it, they'll be absorbed. Okay, so maybe this one absorbs, say, um, blue or green. And then, you know, some of it gets reflected back, comes up again. So the blue and the green are being reflected. And then, the, in this case here, the blue and sorry, blue and green are absorbed along the structure, and then that'll then appear uh, red. And so that gives them the characteristic colour, and as one varies that diameter, then that effect shifts to different wavelengths, and so we see different colours. So my group's currently developing nanowire-based uh, pixels that have, uh, in, that have um, PN junctions in them, so they convert that incident light to current, and we can measure that. And here's a picture that we took with a camera based on those nanowire pixels. Uh, another potential application, so everyone's probably used tweezers, for example, removing a splinter from your finger, okay, regular tweezers, but there's an optical version called the optical tweezer, where we can use the force exerted by light for handling objects without touching them. Okay, so there's some precedent for this. And the precedent is in science fiction, right? I mean, there's, you know, there's a, it gives us a hint that maybe it's going to happen, right? You know, the tractor beam, you know, I've got the spaceship here, light comes and it exerts some force or picks up the car. Okay, so there's some precedent that it, that can, that it could occur. And so science fact, okay, we have, if we have a focused beam of light and have a particle nearby, and the particle can be pulled into that beam by something called the gradient force. And that can become uh, uh, from the Lorentz force law that uh, some folks may have seen before. And so it gets drawn to the region of highest intensity. And so with a regular type of microscope, there's something called the diffraction limit that tells us light can only be focused to roughly about a half a wavelength across. Uh, but on the other hand, that sets a limit to how much force we can exert on a particle, or, or alternatively, how small a particle we can trap stably. So my group developed something called a metal nanopillar optical tweezer. And this is again enabled by these advances in integrated circuit production, 
where we have this gold film sitting on a silicon wafer and this uh, gold pillar protrudes from the top. When we shine light onto it, the light is focused into these nanoscale spots around the top corner of the pillar and the particle can get pulled into it. Okay? You get pulled into it just like a tractor beam, I guess. And so here I'm just going to show you a movie of where we're trapping, we've got a trapping experiment, but these gold pillars, they appear dark in this microscope image. And then we have a nanoparticle about 100 nanometers across. Uh, that white is fluorescent emission from this nanoparticle, which is excited by a green laser. This circle here shows the outline of a laser spot, a near infrared laser spot. And initially the particle, so initially that laser spot is not illuminating the pillar, so we're not getting that nano focusing from the pillar. So in this movie, we're going to move the pillar into that laser spot and we're going to see the particle being uh, trapped. So initially, the particle is only very loosely trapped and not really trapped very much at all. We're trying to move the pillar, the, those black dots, into the laser spot and we're moving it around. All of a sudden, you see that particle hardly moving at all, so it's actually trapped by those optical forces. We turn up the green laser to get a bit more fluorescence from the particle. Then you see it moving around in a circle. So what we're doing is we're rotating the polarization of the laser beam that's striking the pillar. That means that region of enhanced field is moving around the particle, and the particle moving around the pillar, and the particle moves along with it. We stop moving that. We just kind of let it sit for a little bit. Then at some point we're going to turn up the trapping laser. The particle is going to be released. We're going to release the tractor beam. Let it go, and then turn the tractor beam back on again. Oh, I mean the laser beam. Okay, so concluding thoughts. It's the International Year of Light 2015 is the year. And I would argue that it's a very exciting time to be working in optics because previous generations were largely limited, not completely limited of course, but largely limited to the so-called bulk materials, so-called natural materials, you know, glass, silicon and so forth. And so they had to use what they, what they had. But now we have unprecedented control over our ability to produce nanostructured materials and also to model them, understand how they work. And it's leading to all sorts of surprising optical properties and some very fascinating physics and, and we've seen some potential applications that I think is uh, quite important. Uh, acknowledge funding of my uh, research group from various sources. I'd like to thank Steve for setting up these uh, experiments here as well as the refreshments out the front. And lastly, I'd like to thank you for attention. This concludes my presentation. Oh, okay. So, um, so the question was to do with could you use the optical tweezers for concentrating matter for fusion purposes? So, um, that would it depends a bit on. I mean, the the objects we're trapping here. I mean, these are relatively large objects, you know, 100 nanometers or so. Uh, and so it depends on the details there, yeah. So it depends a bit exactly what, what needs to be done. Or, well, it, if, I mean, it depends on the, I guess, the size of the particles that need to be trapped and, the, and that would then set what laser powers are needed and so forth. Uh, yes, a good, interesting question though, it's something to ponder. Yes, so um, I think that when, when you have the tumour cell, apparently, I'm not a medical guy, but apparently you have a lot of blood vessels that feed it, and the nanoparticles, when, if they're the right size, then they can get, they, as they circulate through the body and kind of come to a region where these tumours are, where the, the, the blood vessels are, then they're just the right size to go, go through those leaky blood vessels and accumulate in the tumour. There, so it's due to the size of the nanoparticles relative to the, presumably the sizes of these uh, blood vessels that are feeding the tumours. But for example, those, um, one of the reasons why the, um, those nanometrishkas, they were a little bit smaller as it happened, about 100 nanometers. If I remember correctly, the nanoshells were a bit large, about 150 nanometers. Apparently the 100 nanometers, and they're a bit smaller, they accumulated a bit better in the tumor. And that was one of the reasons, along with the increased absorption of the light, that led to that uh, more, you know, that, that greater effect. It's amazing to see nanotechnology used to cook chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> gentlemen, uh, uh, yes, please. This is an interesting 
Oh, okay. No, I mean, absolutely. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I mean, the, I guess the key thing is uh, the people. You've got, one, you've got wonderful colleagues, both faculty members as well as professional staff and the students. And uh, it's been very exciting to be back again. And I think that, um, you know, we have, uh, I mean, I'm both with physics and with electrical engineering and there's you know, really got wonderful colleagues in both of those places. And we're hoping to make uh, many more exciting discoveries in the years to come. We'll be back for many uh, July lectures, hopefully. <laughs> yes, uh, in the red uh, top uh, near the back. Yeah, yes, please speak very loudly. Yes, I'm not exactly sure how large those are. They're going to be pretty small. Uh, it's, it's going to be both the size and the density. You know, the, when you've got more of the particles there, they're going to be scattering more strongly. Also, larger particles will scatter more. But it's not going to be a resonant type of scattering uh, type of process. But it's going to be both of those uh, in, the, in, that tank type of, in that tank experiment there. Yep. Oh, okay, so that'll be, it's at one gigahertz. So that's more like the sort of uh, thing you have from your mobile phones and so forth, similar to that, not exactly that. Sorry? So that's at a, uh, a much longer wavelength than light, much longer wavelength, much lower frequency. Well, that, they're, they're a type of radio waves. But like, for example, your uh, you know, FM radio, maybe it's about 100 megahertz or so and so forth. So in view of the fact that Melbourne's going to be subject to a very low temperature experiment over the weekend, we might just take one final question <laughs> so there's still time to enjoy the refreshments uh, before heading home. The gentleman in the scarf, uh, I guess. Uh, so uh, most of the examples you had were very simple or spherical. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about work that you're excited about that you've seen much more long standing Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. I mean, it was mainly, I mean, the, I guess the sphere is a nice, simple example to talk about. Well, one of the things uh, we worked on in recent years were, uh, I guess some, they're called bow tie antennas, where you have these two triangular structures separated by a tiny gap. So we looked at some of those and other sorts of structures. One of the things we're very excited by, about is what happens when the gap gets very small. You know, can we still use Maxwell's equations? And so we, we did an experiment where we made <coughs> particles, each about 90 nanometers across, and separated by gaps going from about 10 nanometers to about two angstroms. So it's a very tiny gap. What we found was that we could keep on using Maxwell's equations to when we got below about six angstroms, then Maxwell's equations no longer worked. And so what was happening was that when you get very small gaps, you have tunneling of electrons across the gap. And so remember, this whole picture where you had those oscillating charges, right? And if you have structures separated by a very tiny gap, you can imagine some instant in time you have charges of opposite sign on either side of the gap and have electric fields that span those charges. And you get this tremendous buildup of the fields inside that gap. In other words, it's very bright, I guess. But then what happens if you have tunneling, you don't have as much buildup of the fields, right? As if you've, you've got some structure and I go and stick a resistor between those. I wouldn't do that. But you stick a resistor between those two electrodes, right? And so it actually dropped off. That concentration of the light actually dropped off and we were below about seven angstroms when we measured that experimentally. So that was the intrusion of bottom mechanics. Yes, so yes, mechanics. yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I'll bring it to a close there so there's still time for refreshments. Please uh, uh, come back. We've got three more uh, July lectures to go. We've got five Fridays in July this year. Uh, next week, it'll be a complete change of scene. We're going to distant light a uh, July lecture from the president of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, same time, same place next Friday. Uh, thanks again for coming and uh, safe travels back home again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.